Well, good Monday morning to you all and you too, Vlad. I'm Anne Marie Green <laughs> alongside Vladimir Dutier. Um, so, uh, the Biden administration continuing their hard work of uh, trying to implement many, many things, including this massive coronavirus relief bill. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about the fact that on Friday, I think that they are going to be focusing on immigration. Um, but before all of that, it looks like an impeachment is about to get underway, um, I don't know, by the end of the day at least. That's right, Anne Marie. Uh, approximately 7 p.m., I believe, later this evening, uh, the House will formally walk over the articles of impeachment from one chamber to the next, uh, thereby signaling that it is eminent that the impeachment trial will begin, which we are now told will probably most likely happen in the first uh, couple of weeks of February. Um, and there's a lot to get to, as you said. One of the things that I was fascinated by is we had Dr. Anthony Fauci on CBS this morning uh, talking today about what's possible, what's doable in the next 100 days, as the Biden administration has promised to vaccinate 100 million people over the next 100 days. Also, talking a lot about that interview that Dr. Deborah Burks gave to our Margaret Brennan for Face the Nation. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of questions still in my mind about what she said and how she sort of behaved during her time in the Trump administration. Dr. Fauci this morning on CBS This Morning said she was in a much more difficult position than he was because he didn't work in the White House. Dr. Burks was in the White House and uh, was there practically every single day, although it does make me think that there were perhaps, were there not opportunities that she had to talk to reporters outside of the White House to let them know what was going on. Um, and so we'll dig into that when we take a look back at Margaret's interview. Um, but as you say, yeah. First full week for President Biden in office, and he is reimposing a coronavirus travel ban that his predecessor lifted just days before leaving the White House. The president will sign an executive order on that issue today. It blocks travelers from much of Europe, Brazil, and South Africa from entering the U.S. Officials hope the ban will help slow the spread of the new deadly variants gripping several of these countries. Earlier on CBS This Morning, Dr. Anthony Fauci explained how this could impact America's fight against the virus. It clearly will be helpful. We, we, we have concern about the mutation that's in South Africa. We're looking at it very actively. It is clearly a different and more ominous than the one in the U.K., and I think it's very prudent to restrict travel of non-citizens. But there's also something else that we didn't have before, is that people coming into the country are going to be required to have a test before they get on the plane. When they get off the plane and land here, they're going to have to have a quarantine as well as a second test. So now, of course, this all comes, as we were mentioning, as Dr. Deborah Burks, who was President Trump's coronavirus task force coordinator, speaks out in a brand new interview about her time in the White House. She claims President Trump was given what she calls parallel data about the virus. Ed O'Keefe takes a closer look. There was only one full-time person in the White House working on the coronavirus response. Um, How is that possible? Well, that's what I was given. So what I did is I went to my, my people that I've known all through the last years in government, all 41, and said, can you come and help me? On Sunday, Dr. Deborah Burks, who helped lead the Trump administration's COVID task force, told Face the Nation moderator Margaret Brennan that the former president often received and touted conflicting information about slowing the spread of the virus. I mean, until the day I left, I am po I'm convinced there were parallel data streams because I— Disinformation. I saw the president presenting graphs that I never made. So I know that someone— or someone out there or someone inside was creating a parallel set of data and graphics that were shown to the president. I don't Burks also said she grew frustrated with COVID deniers in the White House who contributed to disinformation campaigns. You know, when you have a pandemic where you're relying on every American to change their behavior, communication is absolutely key. And so every time a, a statement was made by a political leader that wasn't consistent with public health needs that derailed our response. Um, it is also why I went out on the road, because I wasn't censored on the road. Thank you. 
President Biden is focused on his goal of injecting 100 million doses of the coronavirus vaccine over the first 100 days of his presidency, but some administration officials are tempering expectations and warning of how poorly they think the Trump administration handled early distribution of the vaccine. I can't tell you how much vaccine we have, and if I can't tell it to you, then I can't tell it to the governors, and I can't tell it to the state health officials. Meanwhile, top White House aides met virtually Sunday with a bipartisan group of senators to discuss the president's $1.9 trillion COVID rescue plan. Senators described a productive call, but said their top priority is distributing the vaccine quickly. And some are pushing to get a deal in place before President Trump's impeachment trial begins the week of February 8th. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is warning that Democrats might go at it alone if Republicans don't quickly help cut a deal. I am hopeful that Republicans will see the need, but if they don't, there are tools we can use to move forward on our own, and we will. All right, so Ed O'Keefe is joining us now with more on this. Ed, we are going to get into Dr. Burks's uh, interview a little bit later. First off, though, let's just talk about what's on tap for President Biden today. He's set to reverse several of President Trump's policies, uh, including reimposing uh, coronavirus travel restrictions, lifting the ban on transgender people serving in the military. What more can you tell us? Yeah, it's kind of a retread day here at the White House. They're basically putting things back the way they were during the Obama years or at least before President Trump made some changes. Those travel ban changes um, come after the former president made the changes just a few days before he left. He had allowed uh, travel to resume from most of Europe, uh, from Brazil as well. The Biden administration putting those bans back in place and adding South Africa to the list, basically meaning most non-U.S. citizens will not be allowed to come into the country. You heard Dr. Fauci say if they do, they've got to uh, go through some screening and some testing. Uh, this, of course, comes in response to the variant that's been found in South Africa and concerns that those other countries, especially the European ones, are allowing people to cross borders and continue traveling as a member of the European Union. And, and that's just something that the United States isn't comfortable with yet. It's a reminder of how far we still have to go. As for that lifting the ban on transgender people serving in uniform, CBS News has learned that's coming today as well. Already on the schedule today, the new president's meeting with his new defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, the first African-American to hold the job, a former Army general. He'll be sworn in ceremoniously here at the White House. And then it's expected that they will sign this order, essentially ending a ban that was put in place by the Trump administration back in late or in early 2016. The Obama administration had essentially allowed transgender people to continue serving. There was a survey back in 2014. You might wonder how many people actually are transgender in, in the ranks. A 2014 study found it could be as many as 15,500. That was, you know, seven years ago. But it's an indication that we're talking potentially about thousands of people who serve in one of the branches of the military. This was a priority for the LGBTQ community during the campaign and something that the new president vowed to reverse should he won, should he, should he take office, which he has. Uh, Ed, let me ask you about uh, your reporting on the latest COVID relief talks between a bipartisan group of senators and some White House aides. President Biden is urging Congress to pass his $1.9 trillion package. It's not our purview to comment on the benefits or the merits of the package, but we can analyze what we're seeing on the Hill right now, which is this bipartisan group of senators, Democrats and Republicans, coming together to say that they may not be fully on board with the size of this package. And I don't know, a part of me when I saw that in your reporting and elsewhere thought, well, this might be what America needs, which is Democrats and Republicans coming together around an issue um, to encourage the president and the Senate majority leader to maybe look at it, at it from a different angle. That's what they would tell you. Absolutely. This is called what some people call the 908 group, because that was the cost of the proposal that they put forth last year, late last year, that resulted in about $900 billion in COVID relief finally being passed out of Congress. Uh, about eight members of the Democratic caucus, eight Republicans, met with Brian Deese, the top economic advisor here at the White House, the new White House Legislative Affairs Director, and Jeff Zients, who's serving as essentially the COVID uh, director, if you will, here uh, for the administration. And essentially what these senators told the White House is, we need a little more information before we can sign off on this. They're pushing specifically for how the administration figured out how much money they believe schools need, for example, to reopen and retrofit for the pandemic era. They're also curious to see which states and cities really might need more federal aid than others. There are some states that are going to be in the black. 
that aren't going to face a budget shortfall. There are others that are facing significant cash shortfalls, run the risk of not being able to provide basic services, and could have to lay off thousands of state workers. So there's a push to figure out a little more information there. One of the senators involved, uh, Angus King, the independent from Maine, suggested that they need this information because, as he put it, quote, it's not monopoly money. This is actual money that is going to be handed off to our grandchildren, he said, and we've got to figure out how exactly it would be spent. That's not an insufficient or unreasonable request. And as New Hampshire Democratic Senator Jean Shaheen put it to me last night in a phone conversation, she said, this is just conversation one. They expect to continue talking over the next few days. She said she would have liked to see something passed already, uh, but she knows it's going to take a little while. Notably, Angus King suggested that the Senate should try to have a framework in place by two weeks from today when the impeachment trial for President Trump is set to begin, and that conceivably takes up that whole week. The following week is the President's Day recess, so conceivably you won't see the Senate and the House actually pass something till March. That's unacceptable, of course, to millions of Americans who need the relief and members of Congress who want to get something done, and Democrats especially who are pushing to get something ambitious passed with or without Republican support. Um, so let's talk about this interview with Dr. Deborah Birx. Um, in the interview, she said that she believed that the president was receiving alternative data, information that she had not provided. And then this morning, on CBS This Morning, Dr. Anthony Fauci seconded her statement saying, yeah, he believed the same thing. I want to play some of that sound. Well, first of all, there wasn't a full-time team. I mean, she was, you know, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, collecting the data, presenting it to people. But I think the important point that she made that really is critical was the two opposing forces, because she was trying to get information into the president on a regular basis. But the president was getting information from other sources, you know, friends on the outside who would call him up or people who would, who would have input into it. And that gradually attenuated her influence to the point where she didn't really see him very much anymore. Yeah. That's what she was trying to explain. Man, Ed, I found this so illuminating. Vlad, you know, we would watch these coronavirus briefings and the president would show up every once in a while. And sometimes, they would, you know, things would come out of his mouth, former President Trump, that were completely out of left field. And there was a lot of conflicting information. Ed, can you just talk about the significance of learning this and, you know, how it affected the country's overall response to the pandemic? Well, it confirms what we've known all along about the president, that it just depends on who's gotten to him last. And whoever got to him most recently is likely the provider of the information he's set to talk about. And in this case, as the doctor suggests, it was not her. It was other people. She mentions in the interview people like Dr. Scott Atlas, this guy who became a medical advisor to the president, despite not really having a background in epidemics or pandemics. And she obviously was concerned about it, but made clear that her hands were tied. She claimed she was the only one working full time on the issue here at the White House on a regular basis. People like Dr. Fauci, the Surgeon General, the FDA Director, all, of course, had their day jobs at other agencies. She was running point, or trying to at least, here at the White House. And it just shows that it was a disorganized mess. And she also pointed out how the president appeared to take this quite seriously in the beginning, in March, when the country had to start shutting down but that his interest and concern about it waned over time, and she was muffled in her ability to speak out publicly, and uh, it was clearly frustrating. I think the important point she made, and people should go back and watch this if they haven't, regardless of what you think of her, this is an important historical record of the early months of the American response to this. But one of the points she made that I think is incredibly important, not just in this situation, but in all of government, she was, and still is, a career public nonpartisan servant somebody who spent more than four decades serving the federal government across presidential administrations, not taking a party affiliation, but just working on issues of global health, as she pointed out, 60 countries around the world over the course of her career. She said she's very concerned that when career public officials like her are roped into something being done by a president, that they are immediately tainted with a partisan smear. She said that just wasn't fair and doesn't reflect the full scope of her work. This is something that experts here in Washington, uh, this new president, and many others have said about the public service, that they took a real beating over the last four years from a president who tried to, you know, taint them with partisanship, that they were either with him and Republicans or against him and more likely to be a Democrat. And that's just simply not how most of these public servants across the government, be they, 
you know, air traffic controllers, TSA agents, uh, guys that, you know, balance the books over at the Labor Department operate. And I think, uh, you know, it's a testament to the frustration that so many have faced, so many who left government because they just didn't want to be tainted by partisanship. Uh, she's reflecting that in her remarks to Margaret. Yeah, we take her at her word as we only can when she says that she is nonpartisan. I believe that. But, you know, Ed, there are a lot of people who are looking at uh, her behavior and her actions during the early part of this pandemic. Let's not forget uh, back in April of last year when the president sat there in the White House press briefing room and told Americans, you know, supposed you use ultraviolet or just a very powerful light. She was sitting right there. He also went on to talk about disinfectant. Um, she looked down. She looked uncomfortable, but we didn't get a press conference after from her. We didn't get her talking to members of the press, even uh, to uh, pr present herself as a source to sort of counteract that information. So it, it, it's interesting. Um, there was Dr. Fauci on CBS this morning, as you know, Ed said she was in a tough position. She was actually working in the White House and he wasn't. So he was able to sort of get away from that. But, you know, there are a lot of people who are going to look back at this. And Vlad. Well, well, guys, hold on. You know, we should point she, out she, that she, she she addresses that very thank press you, conference, Henry. that brief in in the interview yeah. and you know and, and her assertion is that the way it was kind of presented was a little mischaracterized that the president yeah. wasn't actually speaking to her initially and when she, he did pivot to her she said that bleach or whatever he was talking about ultraviolet light that it wasn't a treatment so and you know like you know Ed just said people should really take a look at the interview the full interview is on our website and I think it's worth looking at and then coming to the, you know what what come to your own conclusions about about where you think she's coming from? Sorry, Ed, I, I wasn't jumped in on you. I wasn't suggesting no, no, no. that she was that she was that he was talking to her directly. I was suggesting that he was talking to the American people, and she, there there were instances after that where she could have addressed it in a in a in a manner that would provide some clarity to those comments after that uh, press conference by the president. But I think the point that she's making, and then many other career public officials or others who were brought in by the Trump administration have said, is that if they had done that, they would have been shown the door right away. And their concern was, do I speak out and correct him clearly in the interest of public safety and public health, or do I run the risk of getting dismissed and then having nobody who has the experience like I do sitting here running point? and at least trying mm. to keep them from doing other things. And that is a conflict that so many people at the Justice Department, Energy Department, other places have said they had. Maybe, you know, a little self-centered and conceited, thinking only I can stop the country from, you know, falling victim to this president. But she has a point in this case, which is either I would go and nobody else would be doing this work, or, you know, I can stay and, and try to control the situation a little more, which it appears she did. And we've seen now the former Surgeon General and Dr. Fauci come out and defend her and say she was doing everything she could. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was a tough position, no doubt. Uh, Ed O'Keefe, always great to have you in that position, sir, in front of the White House for us. We appreciate <laughs> it. Take care, guys.